It's so good to have you today. We welcome you on this wonderful day as we honor the Lord and give him thanks. We appreciate everyone who's been viewing our live streams and also, of course, on YouTube. We're grateful for Sister Kim and Brother Robbie helping us with all the things we do with the sound and the uh, recording of these services. You can find uh, more of these services up on YouTube if you like. You can look on Sister Kim's channel, Kim Wall, K-I-M-A-W-A-L-L. And also, of course, you can just type in my name. And for those who'd like to see Aaron preach, you can uh, type in Bobby and Aaron Jenkins and, and that one will come up also. But we're also glad today for Reverend Price and Sister Betty that's with us and she's here to help me with the music today. Uh, we're gonna honor the Lord, of course, with our worship today and pray together. We certainly want to pray for those who are uh, struggling today physically, those that are, uh, that are sick in body, of course, and those that uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, intercede for them, of course, together today. And let's do that. Let's pray for everybody. Ask for God's help and grace at this time. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege. We just come before you, joining together, Father God, on this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for the privilege of prayer today, Father. We just ask now for those that are struggling physically, God, that they would be strengthened. We pray for our nation, God. We ask for your help and blessing for each and every one. We pray for those that are bereaved and the many families that have been uh, uh, stricken by this coronavirus, Father. We just hold up families and homes and communities, Father God, that are facing a great bereavement and difficulty. We ask for healing and help for our nation. We pray for your protection and blessing for our church family and for everybody around. Father, we just honor you now as we come before you with worship and your word today. God, we give you the glory and we ask for your presence now just to envelop those who have joined us that each heart might be encouraged and strengthened with the things of the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray now, Father. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, Welcome Holy Spirit. Welcome Holy Spirit. We're in the presence of the power.
as we join together this way, this digital way of coming together, let's continue worshiping God and giving Him the glory. We're going to be looking in our Bibles today to Matthew chapter 26. Again, we're glad to have you with us as we continue to give God the glory on this Resurrection Sunday. We're glad for this ability to be able to join together, realizing that so many churches, or probably almost all churches, are not able to gather together as they normally would on this Easter weekend. But we're glad for this privilege to be able to do so. Of course, we want to acknowledge and honor our superintendent of our Assemblies of God, Brother Rick Ross, and all those that labor with him at the district office, and our fellow pastors and ministers and co-laborers in the Lord all across this state. We just pray that during this time that God will grant us revival and souls for our labor. We pray that every heart will be encouraged in spite of the many challenges that we've been facing. And we expect good things from God as we honor Him and seek to worship Him this Sunday. One of the old time preachers said we were built for stormy weather and we've had some stormy weather when it comes to various things that's been happening in our country and around the world. Well, we're glad for the Word of God. We're looking today, as I mentioned to you, the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter. And we're going to be reading verses 30 through 32. That's Matthew 26, and we're looking at verse 30. Uh, the Bible says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. This is a wonderful passage of comfort to us, of course, concerning how Jesus dealt with his own disciples. And the fact that the Word of God gives us uh, several times where the Lord promises us his presence, of course, and also lets us know that he'll be working with us. Uh, those things, of course, I think are some of the most encouraging things in the Bible and some of the most encouraging things about serving God. And in this passage, Jesus said, I will go before you. He said, you're going to be scattered, but I'm still going to go before you. I'm going to be there in Galilee when it comes time for me to reveal myself to you as the resurrected Savior. One young minister was speaking at a retirement home where there was a, a prayer group there of ladies that he was teaching and praying with. And he said to them, gave them the passage of scripture where Jesus said, lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age or to the end of the world. And he said to those ladies, he said, what a wonderful promise that is. One of the ladies spoke up and said, Sonny, that's not just a promise, that's a fact. And we're glad today that it's a fact that Jesus is with us. It's a fact that God has raised him from the dead. And so it gives us a lot of rejoicing, not just on Easter weekend, but for believers, this is a source of great joy and blessing for us all through the year. At all times in our lives, we're reminded that our God is with us and that he is working things out for his glory. Jesus makes reference in this passage to the fact that they're going to be like sheep that are scattered. The Bible gives us a lot of insight into our relationship with the Lord that in so many ways he is our shepherd and we are the sheep. And in this case, of course, he let them know that uh, they were going to be scattered. But remember what he had said to them in St. John chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, and verse 27 also. He says, And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Then verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The Lord said to them, uh, that I'm going to put forth my own sheep and he goeth before them. The Lord said to his disciples, I will go before you into Galilee. We certainly need a shepherd. We need a leader, of course. And these disciples, they're getting ready to face something that was a mystery to them, how this was all going to happen and Jesus dying on the cross. But the Lord let them know that even though that the shepherd would be smitten and also the sheep would be scattered in fulfillment of a passage of scripture in Zacharias, but he let them know that he would be there with them. And of course, uh, you, when you think about the most popular psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23, the Bible refers to the fact that uh, God will lead us, that Christ will lead us. Verse 2 of Psalm 23 says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There's a number of things that God gives us to encourage us 
concerning our relationship with Jesus Christ. He goes before us. Whenever it comes to sheep, sheep are to be led. Uh, cattle may be driven from behind, but sheep are supposed to be led uh, from the front. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is leading us, and we give God the glory that even in this time of distress in our nation, we can expect God to direct our steps. Jeremiah said it's not within man to direct his own steps. Verse 23 of the 10th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But the Bible says if we acknowledge the Lord, he will direct our paths. We're glad today we've got somebody going before us. He's leading the way, and he's calling on us to follow him. And I'm never sorry for calling on people to follow Jesus. And that has been somewhat our emphasis lately as we've been talking about uh, having an authentic relationship with Christ. He's the shepherd, we are the sheep, and we're called to follow him, and we're encouraging people to consider biblical discipleship. We live in an hour where we need to have a deeper experience with Christ in America. We need to have more than just the self-fulfillment teaching that teaches us what all that we can get out of being a Christian. We've got to know also it's going to cost us to be a Christian. We're going to take up our cross and follow him. If we follow him, we may go to places that are not all that pleasant. And we may go through situations that are not all that appealing to us. And we're going to go through things that's going to test us and cause us uh, to be able to have a witness and a testimony to those around about us. We're calling on people today to follow the Lord. And I tell you, there's no shame in following the Son of God who's alive from the dead. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of being a Christian. I'm glad today to be able to honor the Lord. And we're not able to gather like we normally would, but i got to feel like some of those wish yakin brethren are saying amen somewhere out there. And I believe God, a lot of other folks, are acknowledging God today and saying, look here, we are not ashamed of the resurrected Savior. Uh, we love him, we worship him, we adore him. He is the worthy one, and we have decided we're going to give him all the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. We're told today that if you believe in the resurrection, that somehow or another that means you might be ignorant or uneducated. That if you believe in the precepts of Scripture, that somehow or another that means maybe that you have not fully embraced science and all that. We need to remember that the people who pioneered our nation, those who labored and framed our country, that many of them were believers in God and in Jesus. And many of them believed in the resurrection. And they were the finest minds of the times. They had the inspiration of the Spirit of Samaria concerning these uh, institutions they've established in America. So many of the blessings we've had, we believe that those blessings have come because uh, God has been honored in our nation. And so I feel no shame about it. I don't believe it's ignorant. I don't believe it's uneducated to believe in the resurrection. Matter of fact, I believe he showed himself with many infallible proofs. I believe he has witnessed it uh, in the lives of those who've been born again throughout the years. Uh, somebody would say, Brother Bobby, you weren't there whenever the stone was rolled away. I wasn't. But I was there when he rolled my stone away. I was there when he raised me up from spiritual death. When he changed my life and made me new and washed away my sins and gave me a peace that passes all understanding. I was there that day whenever I got born again by the blood of Jesus. Every person, one old time preacher said every person that's been born again has had two births. And that first birth, I can't remember, even though I know I was there. And when I was born of my mother, I, about to, I know there's another birth that I've had that I cannot forget. As one, I can't remember. The other, I will not forget. The day when God raised me up from spiritual death. And so therefore today, I'm going to honor the one that's going before us, that's making the way. He is the way maker, and I plan to follow him every day of my life. The Apostle Paul had... Uh, persecuted Christians who went against the things of God, but the day came after his uh, born-again experience. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul the Apostle said, I want my Christian life to be as one who has been lifted up from among the dead. I want to attain unto the resurrection. That ought to be the goal of every believer uh, to live so differently than the way this world is that we live as those who are alive to God instead of dead in trespasses and sins. Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, some of you uh, certainly have been saved, but you're walking as men. Or as you do the word study on it, he said, you're walking like mere men. You're walking like regular men who are dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says if we're just living for pleasure, we're dead while we live. 
I thank God we're alive unto God through the new birth. The resurrection is a rejoicing uh, in Jesus Christ and in the gospel. The gospel doesn't explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the gospel. Without the resurrection, there wouldn't be any good news. And it wouldn't be any new life. And it wouldn't be anybody uh, having their lives delivered by the power of God. But we expect that the anointing will come upon you even during this time while we're teaching and preaching today. We expect the Spirit of God to confirm the word with signs following. We expect lives to be changed by the power of God. Yeah. We expect people to find hope and blessing and even be able to overcome the fear of death through the knowledge of the resurrected Christ. As we look to the word of God again, we're also reminded uh, in the scriptures that in Revelation 2, chapter 11, Jesus said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. The first death is physical death, but the second death is spiritual death. And of course, if you've been born twice, you'll never die but once. Spiritual death is that second death that is separation from God. And that's why we talk with such urgency. That's why we call on people uh, to receive Christ as their Savior, is because we believe uh, that unless people have Christ as their Savior, they will experience the second death. But to those that overcome, the Bible says, they will never experience the second death. In the same book of Revelation, Jesus says uh, in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 1, this is John's word concerning him. And then we hear the words of Jesus. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead and laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Uh, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Because of this, you and I, we have a tremendous rejoicing in Christ. He's the one that's going before us. He said, I will go before you into Galilee. He said, the shepherd goes before the sheep. And our Savior has already went before us when it comes to death. Now, any religion, any faith that doesn't have an answer for death is of no use to us. It is man's greatest fear. It is the universal fear. Physical death is the thing that holds so many people in bondage. So many people are trying to self-medicate themselves and try to deny the reality of their coming demise and their own mortality. That's why so many folks are trying everything in the world to escape reality because at the end of reality is this death, this physical death. But the Savior, Jesus Christ, glory to God, uh, he died and the Bible says now he has the keys of hell and of death. Now, the one that's got the keys is the one who went first. <laughs> and so we follow him. I tell you, I don't mind following a Savior that has defeated death and was raised up from the dead. Now, this is what our rejoicing is about all the time. The Bible says, in, in this life only, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. If Christ hadn't been risen from the dead, we would just have a religious experience during this life. If all you had was just for this life, it would just make you miserable. Some folks are pretty miserable, and I wonder if this is not part of the problem. <laughs> the only way you can have any joy and be blessed this Sunday is to know that you serve a God that is greater than death. Glory to God. Amen. Our Savior is Master and Lord over death. Death had him there for three days, and he would have kept him if he could. But the Bible says Jesus was raised up from the dead and stripped the armor that Satan had. And the armor in which he trusted was stripped away from him and took away from him the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Uh, what a rejoicing it is today for us as Christians. Thank God we know what's going to happen in regard to death. And the Bible says that death has been defeated. Glory to God. Uh, and that... Uh, a sense that Jesus has defeated death after dying on the cross. But the Bible also says there's coming a day when death will be completely defeated. That the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. One preacher in another state uh, to sort of justify having church services during the coronavirus and having everybody to come in and not following the mitigation guidelines. He said, well, for Christians, death is a friend. But the Bible doesn't say death is a friend for Christians. It says it's an enemy. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Yeah. If we do die, thank God the Bible says, if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. We give God the glory yeah. for that. But death is an enemy, the Bible says. Yeah. But it says the last enemy that shall be yeah. destroyed yeah. is death. The greatest sermon I ever heard preached, I believe, was a sermon entitled, The Day Death Died. Yeah. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to officiate the funeral for death. 
He himself is going to set aside death for all eternity. That's why you want to call on him so that you'll have eternal life in your life. Jesus Christ is going to bring death to an end. And the Bible teaches he's going to put the devil into a bottomless pit. Old Robert says we'll be with Jesus when we put the devil in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And old Robert said we're going to put him head down. That way if he digs, he'll just go deeper. <laughs> uh, thank God uh, we have the victory through Jesus Christ over the death, over the devil the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 25 for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death Amen. hallelujah, the one that's gone before us, the one who reigns at the Father's right hand, the one who lives in the heart of the believer is Lord and Master over death Amen. He is the way maker. He's going before us. He's the one that's causing us uh, to be able to follow him in a way that will cause us to have eternal life. And so therefore we're encouraging everyone to consider following Jesus. Yes. And as I said to you, to follow him means, of course, to be fully identified with him and to do those things he's called us to do. Yes. Hebrews 6.20, the Bible says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Bekizzledek. Christ is our forerunner. He said, I'll go before you in the Galilee. Here he says in Hebrews, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, Christ is our forerunner, and he's went into the holiest of all. In the Old Testament, uh, when the priest would go in once a year, nobody followed him. When he went in there, he was scared about going in himself, and people were scared for him, and they was hoping he could come back out again. But Jesus of Nazareth is our forerunner into the holiest of all and has told us to follow him into God's presence. Now the Bible says that the holiest of all has been made available to us because of Jesus being our forerunner. The word of God says, Hebrews 2.10, that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And the Bible says, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And studying that word captain, it has the connotation of being a pioneer or a trailblazer. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He's bringing many sons to glory. He's the first one. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's our forerunner. He's went ahead of us. He's blazed the trail. He's the captain of our salvation. And he's worthy of our worship. We ought to honor him today and bless his name. He has defeated death so that everybody that follows him does not have to live in the bondage that the fear of death brings to their life. Right. A couple of weeks ago, I preached from St. John chapter 14. The Bible says that Christ has gone to heaven for us. He's defeated death. He's went ahead of us and defeated death and he's went ahead of us to heaven and he said, I go and prepare a place for you that I might be able to come back again and receive you unto myself. We are rejoicing today that our Savior has gone before us, even to heaven itself. He's made big plans for our lives, not only in this time, but in the time to come. The Word of God says we have the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So therefore, we're seeking more than just self-fulfillment type teachings. If we're not careful in America, our worship services will just disintegrate to a place where it's just all about us kind of getting what it is we want and having things uh, to accommodate us. But if you remember in the early church, they weren't seeking to accommodate themselves. They were seeking to glorify Christ and to proclaim him and to follow him. Those who saw him raised up from the dead there originally, every one of them, uh, for the most part, gave their lives uh, for Jesus Christ. They all became martyrs for Christ. If they didn't believe he was alive, we don't think he would, they would have ever stood up to the pressure uh, to give their lives for Jesus. That if they didn't really believe or if they were a part of some type of conspiracy where they stole his body and all that, uh, then they would have never come out there in the open and in public and risk themselves and risk their lives for the cause of Christ. One of the greatest evidences that Jesus is alive is his very followers uh, that whenever they came out there and began to preach and gave their whole lives to Christ, followed him, even when it cost them everything, that lets us know that they had an experience with the resurrected Christ. And I pray today people have a real experience with Christ. If we're not careful, our churches will wind up about an inch deep and a mile wide. And I'm afraid it's happened to us somewhat. We have a pop theology. A lot of times it uh, comes along where we formulate the theology so that the masses will like it and will enjoy it and will congregate to what we're doing. But I tell you one better than that. We need to appoint people to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That no matter whether things are good or bad, no matter what's going on, we are his disciples. We are his children. We belong to Jesus. Every step he takes. When you follow somebody, that means you take the steps they take. 
That means you obey their command. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love Jesus, if you're going to follow him, that means you go to the places he went and you go to the places he sends you. He went to the cross. And I tell you, every born again believer has been to the cross. Spiritually speaking, the Holy Spirit's able to make the cross so real to us that even though we've never traveled to Israel and we couldn't possibly travel necessarily uh, to this exact spot, I would suppose. Some people think they have it there, but it's not so important that we get there to the exact spot, but that we know what happened at the cross. And every believer has had the Holy Spirit to bring that conviction. Paul the Apostle said to the church of Galatia, that because of his ministry and the anointing upon him, that is as if Christ had been set forth, crucified among them. That when he preached, God made it so real that the Galatians, uh, you know, had that experience with the Holy Spirit where God let them know that because of the cross, they were able to be freed from their sins. And Jesus, of course, not only leads us to the cross, he leads us to the upper room. He said to his disciples, uh, go to the upper room. He said for them to tarry there until they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's time to quit debating about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's time to quit debating about a lot of things and just follow Jesus. His words take authority over everybody else's words. If he says we need the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the final word. Glory to God. His word takes the final word over everybody else's word. It's time for opinions and all that just to be set aside and let's lift up the word of God. If the Lord says we need to go to the upper room, let's go. If the Lord says we need the gifts of the Spirit, the power of God, if we need prayer, if he says whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. If he said to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, that's the way we ought to pray. <laughs> now we need to quit battling around and dividing the church over things that are never going to matter in the light of eternity. It's time for us in the body of Christ to get uh, to the place where we're going to follow the resurrected Christ. Uh, God didn't tell us to follow the followers. He said, follow me. We thank God for other followers, but I'm not going to follow any, anybody so close that I fall in the same ditch that they, that they fall into. I'm not here building up a, a group of people to follow me. I'm not building up a fan base. Somebody said, I can tell that by the way you're preaching. <laughs> I'm not here building up a following or trying to build up some kind of thing over YouTube or whatever it is. I'm here to tell you what we're here to do is to tell people that Jesus of Nazareth has the authority over death, hell, and the grave, and he is the head of the church and he has every right to tell us what it is that he wants for our lives. Amen. And we honor that today. We bless his name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says there was a blind man healed in the ministry of Jesus. Mark 10, 52. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. I tell you, that's fundamental. And I realize we're spiritualizing it a little bit. But you know, if you have a healing so dramatic that if you were blind and then Christ opens up your eyes, it only makes sense that you follow him. Yes. <laughs> Now you can see how to follow him because your eyes are open. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for us, uh, our salvation is more dramatic than even a person receiving sight that's blind. As wonderful as that is, as a great a miracle as that is, the Bible teaches we've had even a greater miracle and that you and I have had our spiritual eyes opened up. We've received eternal life. We've received the spiritual blessings that Christ has brought to us through his resurrection. And so today we ought to follow him in the way. We ought to take one step after another and follow our Savior. In closing today, I come across a portion of a hymn that I wanted to read to you. And it was written by a man by the name of Ernest Shurtleff back in 1887. And it came a time there whenever he was about to graduate from seminary in Bible college. And so he was called upon to pen this song so they would have something to sing at his graduation. And as he thought about it, he realized he was going to need a lot more than books and lectures to be able to be a victorious Christian and to fulfill his ministry. So as he began to write, he began to give these words concerning, uh, and he actually gave the, the title, Lead On, O King Eternal. Let me read you the third verse of that song. He said, Lead on, O King Eternal. We follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning wherever your face appears. Your cross is lifted over us. We journey in the light, in its light. The crown awaits the conquest. Lead on, O God of might. And that's our word this Sunday morning as believers. We're praying to the Lord and saying, lead on, O God of might. Lead on, O King eternal. We're going to follow you. He says to his disciples, I will go before you in Galilee. They were about to 
to face one of the greatest disappointments of their lives, that they're going to wind up being scattered. Then all of them were told that they were actually going to betray the Lord. Not like, quite like Judas and not quite like Peter, but all of them would back away from God and from Christ during that time. But the Lord still had this wonderful word of comfort to them. I will go before you into Galilee. If you've missed it, that's not the final word. The final word is God says through Jesus, I will go before you. Now, if you're running into great difficulty, been discouraged, uh, know this this morning. This could be our prayer also. Lead on, O King Eternal. Jesus Christ has blazed the trail for us. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the pioneer of everything. He's the author of our faith. Let us follow him today and give him the glory on this Easter Sunday and every other Sunday and every other day of the week. Let's give him all the praise and the honor and the glory. Thank you so much for joining with us today. We give God the glory for his word. We pray that every heart will be blessed. If you've not yet received Christ as your Savior, let me encourage you to reach out to some minister around you or some believer that is able to help you. And if you would like to reach me, you can. I'd do anything I could possibly do to help people find peace with God. Today we give God the glory. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. What's left of it for God's glory. In Jesus' name, praise God. Lord bless you.